In section 5.2, we will learn how to draw Lewis dot diagrams of covalent compounds. There are certain steps that you need to follow in order to draw a correct Lewis dot structure. The first thing you'll do is count how many valence electrons that are needed by each atom. You will arrange the atoms from the chemical formula into a skeletal structure, connecting them with a bonding pair of electrons, which will be represented with a dash. And then we will place remaining electrons of the total valence that you've counted in step one around the outside of the atoms so that each atom acquires eight electrons. Keeping in mind that if hydrogen is one of those outside atoms, it only needs two to be stable. There are some tips to arranging the atoms in that skeletal structure. The first is we write out the atoms generally in the same order as they appear in the chemical formula. Hydrogen and any halogen, that would be group 7A elements of fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine can only bond with one other atom. They can only be on the outside of that skeletal structure because of their ability to only single bond. And then the last is that carbon, if it's in the chemical formula, always goes in the center. And if carbon is not there, then it's usually the least electronegative atom of the bunch that will go in the center. So let's start out by counting the valence number of electrons. We use our periodic table carbon has four valence electrons and there are four hydrogen atoms and each one has one valence electron. That's going to give me a grand total of eight valence electrons. We're going to set up that skeletal structure. Carbon is in the formula so that's going to go first and we're going to place the four hydrogens very similarly to when we were doing Lewis dot diagrams in that north, south, east, west position. And the third step is that you are automatically going to connect the four atoms of hydrogen to the carbon with a bonding pair of electrons. Every time we have a bond, a bond represents two electrons. So right now in this picture we have eight valence electrons and that's exactly what we want in our picture. So take a look at the picture in the lower right corner and you will see that is exactly what I have drawn with the exception of I use dashed lines in between the carbon and the hydrogens to represent the pair of electrons. They're just using the actual dots. Uh, what I do want to point out is that there are only eight electrons in the picture, which is what we need. And not only does it have the correct number of electrons, but you can see that carbon has its octet, its eight electrons, and each hydrogen has a duet. Remember that hydrogen, helium, and sometimes lithium, um, they are going to need only two in order to be stable. So we would definitely say that all atoms have their full valence shells and the drawing is correct. If we take a look at that drawing again, you will see that the pair of electrons between the carbon and the hydrogen are called a shared pair or a bonding pair. We're going to go ahead and try these two together and then you'll be doing some more in class. Let's take a look at the first picture. We've got carbon which has four valence electrons. Hydrogen has one, but there are three of them, so that's a total of three. And iodine has seven valence electrons. So that's going to give me a total of 14 valence electrons. Of course, carbon is in the chemical formula, so that will go in the center. And we're going to take the three hydrogens and the iodine, and we will place them in that north, south, east, west position. It really doesn't matter where that iodine is as long as it's on one of the four sides. We're automatically going to connect the atoms with a bonding pair of electrons. So that gives us eight electrons. We need to put in another six for that total of 14. We know that the hydrogens already have uh, satisfied the duet rule, so we're going to put that remaining six around the iodine. Okay, so basically, if we take a look at carbon, you can see that it has an octet, the iodine has an octet, and each one of the hydrogens has a duet and we've kept the 14 electron maximum in the picture. We don't usually draw it with a circle, so I'm just going to redraw it down here uh, just so that you can see it again without the circle. I just wanted to show you how every atom has a full valence shell. All right, let's take a look at the second one. The second one has phosphorus, which has five valence electrons. Chlorine, there are three atoms, and it has seven valence electrons, so that's a total of 21 that's going to give me a total of 26 electrons. So the least electronegative atom is phosphorus. That's going to go in the middle. And I'm going to place the other uh, three chlorines 
in either the north, south, east, or west position. It doesn't matter which ones. And I'm automatically going to connect the atoms with a pair of electrons. That gives me six electrons. I need 26. So I'm going to start on the outside, and I'm just going to start putting electrons in as pairs. This is important that you do it as pairs, not as single electrons. So we have, that would be 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, and I'm going to put my last pair on top of the phosphorus to make 26. If we quickly take a look at this, we've got the maximum number of electrons in there, and now that you can see each chlorine has a total of 8 electrons around its outer shell, and so does the phosphorus. Once again, we don't usually draw in those circles, I'm just trying to show you the, that all of the atoms are meeting their full outer shell electrons of octet, and I'm going to go ahead and just redraw this down here. And we'll put the chlorines back where we belong. Drop in the electrons, which we are calling lone pair of electrons. And there we go. There is your final picture. So what happens if you're following those three rules and you put in the correct number of electrons in the picture, but you still have atoms that have not completed their octet? Well, what that basically signals to you is that a multiple covalent bond will need to be present. And that means that either a double or a triple bond will be placed into the picture. In order to figure out which one will go into the diagram, you will move a lone pair of electrons in between the atoms that are deficient to satisfy that do outer octet rule. Let's take a look at the example of CH2O. So once again, if we counter valence electrons, we've got four here. We've got two hydrogens with one valence electron. And we've got oxygen to six. That gives me a total of 12 valence electrons. Of course, carbon is there, so we're going to put it in the middle. And I'm just going to take my hydrogen and my oxygen and move that into the skeletal structure seen below with the dashes to connect the atoms. So we know that we have six uh, electrons in that picture. We need 12. We know each hydrogen is already satisfied with the duet, so I'm going to hit the terminal ends of oxygen, and I'm going to add another pair, so that gives me 8, 10, and 12. So I do have the maximum number of electrons in that picture, and you can see that oxygen has its octet, and each hydrogen has its duet, but carbon is not satisfied with its octet. So this is not correct. What this tells me is that I'm going to need a multiple bond. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this pair of electrons in between the carbon and the oxygen. When I do that, and I'll redraw it over here, you will now see that I still have 12 electrons in the picture, but every atom now has either the duet or the octet. So the final structure will look like this. So a double bond is when two pairs of electrons are shared between the same two atoms. You can see that in the picture down below. And then we also have a new vocabulary word called a lone pair of electrons, also known as an unshared pair. These will be the pairs of electrons that are on the terminal ends, on the outside ends of atoms. So in this particular diagram, I would have two lone pairs of electrons, and I would actually have four pairs of shared electrons. Sometimes a double bond isn't going to do it, and we will need to put a triple bond into the picture, so let's take a look at this example real quick and show you how that lays out. For carbon, once again, remember it has four valence electrons, and there are two carbon atoms in this formula, so that gives us a total of eight. And then, of course, we have two hydrogen atoms. Each one has one valence electron. That's two. That's giving me a total of ten valence electrons. This is a unique situation because there are two carbon atoms. So how do you get two carbon atoms in the middle? You don't. You put them side by side. So as I put them side by side, I will automatically connect them with a bond. And that's two electrons. And now you kind of see that I have an uh, opportunity for six different places to put those hydrogen atoms. I only need two. So I like to do things very symmetrical. What you do to one side, try to do the same to the other. And so I'm going to put my two hydrogens 
in those positions. And that gives me a total of six electrons. Now you know you need 10, so I'm going to use uh, red to represent the last uh, two pairs to give me 10. All right, so in this picture, you can see that the 10 electrons are in there. I cannot put any more in. However, I have a carbon, you can see that right here, that does not have an octet. And so what that means is I'm going to take this pair and I'm going to move it in. And I'm going to have to do it a second time to actually get that octet for that carbon. So what the picture really looks like in the end is like this. And you will see that there are no lone pair. And if we quickly look at this picture, you can see that the hydrogen has a duet, this carbon has an octet, this carbon has an octet, and this hydrogen has a duet again. So the correct picture. I will redraw down here again without the circles. It's right here. We call that a triple bond, and that's when three pairs of electrons are between two atoms. All right, so let's try these two and we'll do some more in class. Uh, let's come up with a valence number of electrons. There's one here, four, and five, giving me a total of 10. Carbon is gonna go in the middle. And I'm just gonna put the nitrogen and the hydrogen on either side of it, make the connection. So that's four. I always start on the outside to put the remaining electrons. That's six, eight, and 10. And hopefully you will notice that the hydrogen has a duet, the nitrogen has an octet, but the carbon does not have an octet and I cannot put any more electrons in, which means I'm going to have to rearrange. So I'm going to take this pair and move it in, and I'm going to take this pair and move it in as well, and I'll end up getting this for hydrogen cyanide. Now everybody has the octet, and we do have 10 electrons only in that diagram. If we take a look at carbon dioxide, carbon is 4, oxygen is 6, times 2 is 12, that's going to give me a total of 16 electrons. Once again, carbon is going to go in the middle. I'm going to put each oxygen on either side of the carbon and connect. That's four. And I'm going to do the six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. Notice that I skipped the central atom. I try to get the octets around the terminal atoms first. I know I have the maximum of 16 electrons in the diagram, and I can see very clearly that the carbon in the middle does not have an octet. So what that means is I'm going to move this pair in. Now I could also take this pair and move it in as well, but we talked a little bit about symmetry. So instead of doing that, I'm just gonna take this pair and move it in, and I'll end up getting this diagram right here. And now all of the atoms have the octet, and there's only 16 electrons in the diagram. So we can look at some of the properties of the different types of bonds, single, double, and triple and we will notice a pattern. If we're comparing the single to the triple, we'll find that the length of the bond is definitely shorter as a triple bond and longer as a single bond. And that has a lot to do with the pairs of electrons that are in between the atoms. Remember, a single bond is one pair, a double bond is two pair, and a triple bond are three pair. So there's strength in numbers. There are more pairs of electrons between the atoms. The more they pull the atoms in closer together, and that shortens the bond. When we're talking about the strength of the bond, it'll be very weak for a single bond and very strong for a triple bond. So we see this uh, increase in strength, and that once again has to do with the numbers of electrons that are between the atoms. And then, of course, if we have a stronger bond, it will take more bond energy to break that bond than it would in a single bond, which would need lower bond energy. If we take a look at this picture, you can see a carbon-carbon single bond uh, has a length of 154 picometers and only requires 348 kilojoules of energy to break. Whereas if we look at the double and the triple bond, you can definitely see that the bond length is decreasing and since the bond strength is going to increase, that you can see that there is going to be a greater amount of energy needed to break it down. The last type of diagram that we're going to draw is one for a polyatomic ion. Remember that that is a group of atoms bonded together that has a single charge. We're going to look at carbonate, and we're going to follow the same rules we did before. We've got four valence electrons. Here we have six 
electrons, but there are three atoms, so that's going to give us 18. So right now that gives us a total of 22 electrons. What makes this uniquely different is we have to take a look at that overall charge. Remember that negative 2 actually means that it needs to gain 2 electrons. And so we're going to add 2 electrons to the 22 to make 24 valence electrons that we have to put in this picture. Of course, carbon will go in the middle. We will put the three oxygen atoms on the north, south, east, or west position, automatically connecting one with the bonding pair. That gives me six. I'm going to start dropping pairs of electrons around the terminal atoms. Eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, and 24. And so real quickly, you can see that we have no octet around the carbon, which means I do need to take a pair of electrons and move it in. So I'm going to redraw this, and you end up getting this picture right here. So every atom will have its octet, and there are only 24 electrons in the picture. I'm going to put brackets around that diagram with a negative 2 on the outside to remind uh, someone that is looking at this picture that it is a polyatomic ion. Now I do want to just add one more comment to this picture. This is not only a diagram of a polyatomic ion, but it is also an example of something called resonance. So when you can draw a structure, if you can keep the atoms in the same position, but move a multiple bond around it in different places, that is called resonance. So I could have drawn the picture above like this, and it still would have been correct. Okay, and I also could have drawn it like this as well. So there's actually three different resonance structures for this picture. And if I do ask you about resonance, I would expect that you would draw all three of these structures. We generally would put arrows in between them. So this diagram shows the carbonate ion and then shows how sodium will bond with it in order to make sodium carbonate, that ionic compound. You won't have to do any of these in class, but I just wanted to give you an idea of how they would all lay out. So if we take a look at this carbonate ion, it only has 22 electrons in it. Where is it going to gain the other two electrons? From the sodium. Remember that each sodium will give up one electron, and that will fall into these two places. So when sodium gives up its electron to the oxygen, we'll put sodium right next door to each one of these oxygens, and we'll get rid of the charges because they've now neutralized, and you get this overall diagram.